This video is sponsored by NordVPN. Click the link in the description for 75% off a 3 year plan and take back your security online today. When it comes to handling controversial topics in fiction, there is a fascinating disparity. Take for example the recent season of Doctor Who which has been widely criticised for being too political. So if an alien were to see just the reaction to that one season of the show then they might think that, well, controversial political topics have no place in fiction, people just don't seem to like them. How However, when you take a step back and look around, that idea really begins to fall apart because there's a ton of fiction out there that covers the most sensitive, the most controversial topics, yet is received with near universal acclaim. Films like Look Who's Back or American History X, for example. I mean, American History X is all about racism in modern day America. You'd be hard pressed to find a more sensitive topic than that. Yet the vast majority of those who have watched the film seem to very much enjoy it. Doesn't that strike you as odd? How one work can cover politics and be torn down for allegations of being too political, but another can get drenched in the most sensitive topics, exploring every nook and cranny, yet receive critical acclaim and become beloved by the public. This topic on how to cover political ideas in fiction, it's an enigma. It feels like nobody ever talks about it, and thusly, it fascinates me. And I hope after watching this video, it fascinates you. Too. Now a quick disclaimer before we begin, I will cover some rather sensitive themes and topics depicted in various fiction and it will trigger some people out there so preemptively I apologise. But this video essay is not about any political idea, rather it's all about how we as storytellers can cover highly sensitive topics out there and do it right. And I think for this essay these two elements are verse propaganda. I think if we explore and elaborate exactly what they mean and what role they play in our fiction, then we'll uncover exactly what we're looking for. Now first off, to clear the air, the word propaganda has a number of connotations. I'm sure when you hear the word you think of World War II or Stalin's Russia, but today please try to put those connotations to one side, because for this video we are going to be working with this definition of propaganda. A piece of fiction designed to make the viewer adopt a certain point of view. So please bear in mind, under this definition, something doesn't have to be political in order to be propaganda. So if the core message of a story is that runner beans are good for your health, because it's presented in a one-sided way, the story about that vegetable is technically propaganda. So in order to realise where Doctor Who fits in with all of this, we really could talk about any episode in the recent season, but there is one example that stands out for all the wrong reasons, and it's the episode Arachnids in the UK. So here's the plot for this episode. There are a number of giant spiders roaming around and have been eating people. In this episode, the main villain has been illegally dumping toxic landfill in a coal mine beneath a hotel, and that toxic landfill has been causing these mutations in the spiders, and has been causing all these deaths of innocent people. Now inherently, just from hearing that concept alone, you might think, how could there be anything political about that? Maybe it's to do with pollution, how humans aren't taking care of our environment and we should all be doing our part to clean up the planet. Well, you'd think that that would be the main theme that lends itself to such a concept, but no. And honestly, when I tell you the political message this episode has, you are going to laugh. Uh, bearing in mind that concept I just told you, this episode's main theme, it's Donald Trump. But how do we know that this is all about Donald Trump? Well, the main villain who dumped all the illegal waste in the mine, he is symbolic of said figure. The character is American. He's a billionaire running a massive corporation. They make a big deal about how he's going to run for president in the next US election. He's running for president in 2020, aren't you? Well, I haven't declared my intentions yet. Now, I want to stress this. Whether or not Trump is good or bad is not what we're discussing here. That's not the point of this video. The only thing we're analysing is how this episode of Doctor Who handles having a controversial political topic as its core theme. So the BBC are making commentary on Donald Trump in this episode, so naturally that opens up a whole wealth of angles in which this could have been executed. Maybe Chibnall could have made commentary on the nuances of politics, how when people are desperate for a change 
change in the status quo, then they will often choose something at the extreme end of things just to get that change without a regard for whether or not that thing is actually good. I mean, that's actually a very relevant topic for many countries right now. And covering that, all without telling the audience whether that's good or bad, could have made for genuinely interesting fiction. So, let's look at this Trump-esque character. Let's start with the cons. The episode starts with him forgetting that his personal assistant is in fact a member of his family, and he has to ask her how he is related to her. So that's poor social skills and negligence on his repertoire. Shortly after that, the manager of the hotel comes in asking some benign questions about operations, as managers do, and then he fires her. For no other reason than the fact she walked into the room and that in itself mildly annoyed him, so he fired the manager of his hotel. So that makes him both a narcissist and a total asshole. About five minutes later, the woman he fired is in the reception, about to leave the building. When unprompted, he gets his bodyguard to take out his gun. I'm not even joking, this really happens. And he holds the ex-manager at gunpoint, threatening to murder her because she's taking too long to leave the building, which, by the way, is a hotel. She's in the hotel lobby. This is the UK, might I remind you, where, you know, handguns aren't exactly legal, and neither is threatening to murder ex-employees with an illegal firearm because they take longer than three minutes to clear out their desk. So I have no idea how to add that to this list because it's so moustache-twirlingly evil. So let's just summarise by saying criminal and adding a times two to the arsehole. So then a giant spider attacks him while he's in the bathroom and his bodyguard goes in to help. He then closes the door, abandons his bodyguard, using him as a human happy meal so the spider won't eat him. So this makes him both a coward and also an arsehole three times over. He then gets legitimately furious at the doctor because she doesn't know who he is and he then proceeds to brag about his accomplishments and his highly successful hotel chain. Because, you know, Trump has a hotel chain as well. Just to make the parallel just that little bit more excruciatingly obvious than it already was. So let's add massive ego and vanity to that list. And all of that is just in the first half of the episode. There's a point later on where the main villain spider is dying because it can't breathe, and everyone feels pity for it, and sad violins play, and Chibnall tries his absolute best to build sympathy for the monster. And then the Trump-like character barges into the room wielding a pistol, shoots the thing in the back of the head while it tries to run away, and proceeds to say, this is what the world needs right now. This is what's going to get me into the White House. He says that after shooting a scared, injured, dying insect in the back as it tries to run away. Jesus Christ, if that moment alone doesn't make it desperately transparent as to what Chris Chibnall is trying to achieve here. So now we've assembled this massive list of negative traits by barely scratching the episode's runtime, let's look at his positive ones. What does this character do that makes him a good person? Yeah, he doesn't actually have any positive character traits. Chris Chibnall uses every scene this character is in, every line, every syllable he utters in an attempt to make the audience hate him as much as is humanly possible. Not to mention he's the main villain of the episode. Now, whether or not you think Trump is a good or bad president, that is not what we're discussing here. What we are discussing is how this method of delivering political themes in fiction is objectively speaking speaking, the most lazy, the most biased, and frankly, the most boring way of handling political topics in fiction. And that's the thing about propaganda, as it is by its very nature the pinnacle of anti-intellectual. It does all the thinking for you. It tells you what the right opinions are. It tells you what the wrong opinions are. The thing is, is we as consumers of fiction secretly yearn to have our minds tested. We want our fiction to start a conversation and not end it. We want that question to exist and for us to have the ability to find our own answers through it, and not to be told what the writer thinks the correct answer is. 
In the episode of Arachnids in the UK, this Trump-like character fits the definition for what I like to call the punching bag. Whenever you see a piece of fiction that is firmly rooted in the propaganda end of the spectrum, you almost always have a punching bag. Now this isn't some widely accepted thing, this is just my own terminology, so accept it if you like, but a punching bag is a character who embodies a theme, idea, group, or person the writer is trying to demonise, so as a result, said character will have exclusive exclusively negative traits to make said thing being demonised appear bad by association. The point being, great art is nuanced. It is unbiased and even the most sensitive of topics. It presents a thing as it is in life, not controlling it to try and make it look bad, not contorting it to try and make it look good. Great art is above all else honest. These episodes of Doctor Who share more in common with the propaganda posters you see from World War II than they do with the works of Tarantino, Nolan and Spielberg. A real artist is not someone who's trying to say anything, rather they are someone who explores a topic, provides an insightful discussion about the thing, but doesn't explicitly tell the consumer what the correct conclusion is. But what's an example of that? So far we've been focusing entirely on what makes for low quality art, but what makes for great art? What is an example where a polarising topic is explored and done so in a way that makes for genuinely fantastic fiction? Now normally on this channel I cover film and occasionally TV, but today I want to break that format because this next example affected me so tremendously, is of such quality and is of such a perfect fit for what we're looking for that I feel compelled to make an exception and focus on something entirely different. And this example is of course The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. Now I know most of you watching this don't play video games, but you're going to find this next example really quite useful anyway because what makes for a great story is universal. Those core principles of character and plot and great storytelling apply to games as much as they apply to film, novels and every other form of fiction. So in this game there's a quest around this character nicknamed the Bloody Baron. And it unravels like a mystery. He's the ruler of a large chunk of land and both his wife and daughter have gone missing. He tasks the protagonist with finding them. Initially it seems they were kidnapped but then it's revealed that they ran away of their own accord which comes across as rather strange. So you dig a little deeper and you find out that he was abusing his wife, this bringing up the whole topic of domestic violence. And later on you find his daughter and she tells you this. Father would drink disappear for days, then come home in a rage and send furniture flying. Thank the gods for war, I was glad every time they sent him off. I remember him screaming at mum, the thuds as he beat her, then her sobbing. Everything points to him being this evil, cruel person. But later on in the story, he tells you what happened from his perspective. I went from front to front, battle to battle, collecting soldiers' coin, while Anna sat alone with the babe for months. Later, I learned she'd not been so alone after all. For nearly three years, she'd found comfort in the arms of one Evan, a childhood friend. Understand, damn it! One tussle in the hay I'd have waved aside, put it out of my mind. But the woman cuckolded me for years, without a whisker of concern for me, for my love. So he then speaks about how he learned about all this. He came home from war one day to find his wife and daughter missing. The letter she left said she didn't love him anymore, and not only that, but she'd been betraying him for years, all the while living under his roof. And not only that, but she was taking his child away from him so they could both live with this new guy. She says that he'll never be able to see his daughter again. I mean, imagine how you'd react if you came home one day and found that out. So what did he do next? Well, his name's the Bloody Baron. What do you think he did? He murdered her secret lover, took back his family, and held his wife in the fort against her will like a prisoner. Then in grief because he murdered the one she loved, she tried to murder him by coming at him with a knife. So then he hit her in self-defense as she tried to kill him. That was the start. That was the first instance. After that, he'd hit her routinely. That was the start of their abusive relationship. Anna tried to take her own life and mine several times. She would prod me, goad me, taunt me in the hope I would hit her again, perhaps. She'd scream that I'd robbed her a life of love, that I'd destroyed the idea for her and so might as well kill her. How many times I apologised, 
How many armfuls of blooms and gifts I brought. She cared not a bit. There's something so real about this story. This story doesn't try to make you think anything. It simply shows you an unbiased, impartial depiction of what domestic violence can look like. And there's something about this story that really resonated with me, really affected me to my core. It was the Baron. The reason why was because he was so human. See, in another part of the story, there's a character, Siri, who's wounded and tired, so that very same Baron takes her in, gives her a bed, gives her food, while she recovers. Siri just so happens to be a very attractive young woman. The moment I saw this happen in-game, I was convinced, absolutely convinced, that the Baron had a secretly evil motive. I expected some extremely awkward scene where the Baron gets drunk and forces himself upon her. The reason why is, well, he's a domestic abuser, therefore he is the devil incarnate. His heart is black as coal because that's how such a character is usually depicted in fiction. Then the time comes where she has to leave his company, he wishes her luck, and then she leaves. Without incident. I was thrown for such a loop when this happened because this game did something revolutionary. It depicted this man as a human. Where even though he's done horribly immoral things, such as murder and domestic abuse, he still helps people in need for no other reason than because it's the right thing to do. There's something so inherently powerful in that. And going back to the story between the Baron and his wife, there comes a point much later on where, due to the mistakes I made as the player, his wife ends up dying in his arms because of a magical curse. It being this total tragedy. He looks at the dead wife's corpse, goes quiet, he mumbles that the protagonist can get their pay from his subordinate, and then he just walks off without another word. And later on, when you come by his fort to collect the pay, you see him hanging from a tree. He committed suicide because his wife was dead. And even though he was abusive towards her, he loved her more than anything else in the world. And loved her so much that he didn't know what the point in life was without her. So he ended it. When I saw his body swaying on that rope, I cried so hard, you don't even know. This is art. This is what great fiction is all about. When you treat the audience like a patronizing teacher lectures a nine-year-old, telling them what to think, how to feel, you bastardize what makes art so great. When you cover controversial topics in fiction, it is easy to take the easy path and be agreeable to lean towards the propaganda end of the spectrum and just say, okay, so he's a domestic abuser, thusly he is a two-dimensional bad guy, we will not explore his motivations or past because this man represents something we as a society view as morally abhorrent. And God forbid we can't confess that people who embody negative things in fiction are human beings. Because in doing so, we would be confessing that said evil people are so much more like us than we ever dared to think. When covering controversial topics, or any topic whatsoever, even if it's not controversial, never say that this is bad. Never say that this is good. Simply say, this is. And let the viewer figure out the rest. Something terrible has happened. I'm sure by now you're all aware of this, but Article 13 has passed, which for every one of you watching is terrible news, but for my EU-based viewers, this news is god-awful. Simply put, the internet inside the EU is likely to become radically censored because of these new laws, and creators like me and most other creators on YouTube that you watch will become banned from being seen inside the EU. The amount of support I've gotten from you guys on this has been humbling. So many of you have emailed me giving a heartfelt goodbye because you'll never be able to see my content again. But today I want to educate you on a way that you can overcome the effects of Article 13 so you don't have to say goodbye to your favourite content creators. That being using NordVPN, who I can happily thank for sponsoring today's video. But when you use NordVPN, you can essentially lie about your location. So let's say that I'm browsing from inside Germany and I want to be able to watch my content 
content creators who have now been banned inside Europe. Well, all I had to do is boot up NordVPN, click on any one of 60 countries they have available, but let's say the USA for example, and within less than a minute you're linked up and viewing the internet as it appears inside America, which means all of those region blocks which, because of Article 13, are about to come in and censor the entertainment you're allowed to see, well, you can get around them, and all it takes is the literal click of a button. And to my non-EU viewers, such as those in the USA, I still can't recommend this service highly enough, because getting around region blocks is only one of the many reasons why you need NordVPN in your life. Uh, here's another one. When you're using NordVPN, they utilise military-grade encryption on all of your data, which means if anyone is peering into what you're looking at, for example criminals or even your own government, all they see is gibberish, which means you can browse online with great peace of mind, knowing that nobody in the world apart from you knows what you've been looking at. So please, if you value your freedom and security online, then please click my link in the description, that's nordvpn.com forward slash the closer look, or when at the checkout, use my code the closer look, and you'll get a three year plan where not only do you get the incredibly low price of $2.99 a month, but also you'll get a free month on top for no extra charge. Really, in this day and age, a good VPN is as important for your security online as a good antivirus is. Nord didn't ask me to say this next bit, this really is my own opinion. I firmly believe that Nord is the best VPN on the market right now, which is why I've been so happy to sponsor them time and time again on this channel, because as someone who uses their service myself, I can wholeheartedly recommend it. And for a price that low to retain your security on the internet, the word bargain is wrong. It doesn't do this service justice. This is an absolute steal. So please click my link in the description, that's nordvpn.com forward slash the closer look, or when at the checkout, use my code the closer look to secure yourself online today. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time on The Closer Look.